Uh, he's Chuck Klosterman, the uh, writer, author, uh, article in GQ on Kobe Bryant. Of course, uh, writes for Grantland. Uh, great music writer as well. And uh, Chuck joins us now. Chuck, I was listening yesterday. You were on with Dan Levitard. And you are talking about music. And you are talking about, uh, I think, uh, Noel Gallagher of Oasis. You were talking about Marilyn Manson as well. If, if I said you could profile a musician or an athlete, any athlete, any musician, which one would you take? That's an interesting question. I think probably there are more musicians out there that I would be curious to hear them discuss the way they perceive themselves. Like if I could interview Axl Rose or Prince, I think that would probably be a little more interesting. Among athletes, Kobe is probably about as compelling as you're going to find um, in terms of his not just sort of his kind of natural intelligence, and the straightforward way he sort of considers uh, how he's perceived and his interest in how people see him. Here's a guy, and I know a couple of these quotes stood out in the GQ article, but he said he didn't have any real friends. But I was wondering if his, if his childhood, his background, growing up, where it seemed like he would have, he knew he was going to have temporary friends because he would be moving around while his dad was playing professional basketball. Did that form him in his, in his uh, friendships? I think probably when the age he was at, you know, he was an adolescent and he's in living in Italy and he doesn't really speak the language yet. I don't know if, if a person would have the maturity at that point to sort of realistically say like, well, okay, these friendships are going to be limited. My assumption is that he did what a lot of kids did, which is attempt to sort of ingratiate himself to wherever he was. Uh, and sometimes it worked and sometimes it didn't, but in both cases he would just move again. I mean, it's uh, the strangeness of his life, I do think, is sometimes uh, sort of an underreported thing. I mean, it, it was always sort of expressed as though because, you know, uh, you know, his father played professional basketball overseas, you know, he didn't grow up like the other players, but he really didn't grow up like other Americans. <laughs> you know, I mean, he was wealthy and he would come back to Philadelphia in the summer and he had this strange experience and... I, you know, it, I'm sure it did, you know, make him weird. And I think it's been a long, it took him a long time to really accept that he's a weird person, but that's, it, for what it, you know, that's totally fine. I remember being in San Antonio, and there was a party for Shaquille O'Neal, and I remember going to the party, and some of the, uh, the, the Lakers were there, and I said, I jokingly said to Rick Fox, I said, where's Kobe? He goes, Kobe doesn't socialize with us. And it just struck me as odd that they said he's probably in his room right now. Yeah, you know, uh, I interviewed Steve Nash for Esquire uh, several years ago. And, and you know, Steve Nash is not like Kobe. He seems to have good relationships with a lot of guys he plays with and stuff. But even he kind of conceded that just because his interests were different. Yeah. I mean, there, if you might recall this, there was a big story about Steve Nash in the New York Times. Um, he was reading the Communist Manifesto, and people always kind of brought this up, that he was reading this book. But when you think about it, I mean, if you're in an environment around athletes, it might not be that just you have, you know, sort of different ideas about sort of what's interesting, but you might be perceived as being almost like, a, what are you trying to prove by mm -hmm. doing that? Like, you could get ridiculed the same way a 14-year-old does as an adult. Maybe that's what happened to Kobe when he was young. I'm not saying he was sitting around, like, you know, reading Russian novels or whatever, but I wonder if, if the other guys on the team were like, well, not only is this guy very confident to the point of arrogance, but uh, we can't even really joke around with him because he's just not like us. He's Chuck Klosterman, the uh, writer, author, the article on Kobe Bryant in uh, this month's GQ, joining us Dan Patrick show. You broached the, the topic of uh, the rape trial in Colorado with Kobe, and it, it, I don't know if, if um, he was open or welcoming it, but it felt like he wanted to get something off his chest. He'd feel like, I guess, unfairly uh, charged with that, but almost wanted to talk about it. I, is that a fair assessment, though, of the, when the conversation? Okay, well, going into this, you know, of course I read many, many, many pieces about Kobe Bryant, and, it, and he just never talked about the rape allegations anywhere. And, and, to, and if it was, it was so glancing and so fleeting, it was almost like it didn't need to be in there at all. So my assumption going in was that this is just something he doesn't talk about. Um, now I suspect that maybe... No one had ever really directly asked him about it before, because 
early in our conversation, I was like, I just want to ask you the things that have been interesting to me about your life over these last two decades. Just, I don't want to pretend like we're having some kind of interpersonal conversation or that we're going to become friends. None of that's going to happen. I want to just ask you these things. So maybe because I said that, he was like, well, certainly he's going to bring up the rape accusation because he actually brought it up first. Oh. Like, I was going to ask it, but he made a reference to it before I did. And there, of course, you could go right into it once the guy does, you know. Did you learn anything from that? Um, well, the stuff about friendship, you know, which t- to me, I'm very surprised that this is the thing that people seem to be most interested about this piece. That didn't surprise <laughs> me at all. It, I felt like this was like an established thing that everyone knew about him. Um, I was surprised that he went to a priest during the, the, the Colorado incident, not because that's some insane thing to do, but I don't view him re- as a very religious person the way so many athletes are so openly spiritual. Um, and I was pretty surprised that I would have guessed uh, when I asked him about Phil Jackson and Shaq, my assumption was going to be that he would maybe say negative things about Shaq, but ultimately say good things about Phil Jackson, because I, I always assume that he viewed Jackson as a real important person in his life. But my sense is that he has uh, more animosity still now, I mean, going forward, toward Jackson, mm. uh, because I think that he perceives Jackson not viewing him as sort of an intellectual equal, and I think Kobe feels that he is. Uh, final 30 seconds. Chuck, how does this end for Kobe? Well, he's not going to come back this year. He's going to join a team next year that I can't imagine is going to be much better. I mean, if they get Dragic, whoever they sign, they're going to be a, a real limited team. Um, I think, though, that being so open to people in the media like this is going to help him. I think that it that I get the sense that people's perception of his personality is changing in a way that's positive for him. Uh, glad to have you on. Uh, next time we'll talk music. Okay, sure. I would love to. Thank you, Chuck. Bye-bye. That's uh, Chuck Klosterman, the uh, writer, author, uh, the article in GQ, and uh, Kobe Bryant.